So in this session, we're going to be looking at first impressions. Oftentimes, you only have one chance for someone to join your church. And that chance is based on impressions. So we're going to do this in two parts, part A, part B. If you have the, this sheet here, first impressions, part A, evaluating your physical surroundings. That's what I'm going to be going off of. And then Pastor Nate Elias, wave your hand, Nate. He's pastor of the Peachtree City Church, and he's going to be talking about what happens once you come in the door. And uh, they've got a great program down there, and so he'll be completing this. We're going to have to do a, a technology switchover because he's got his stuff on his computer and I've got mine on mine. But that's, uh, that's all right. We'll make it work. Um, so I think I got this fixed. Let's, let's try it now. Basic minimums. Um, now, I'm going to show you some pictures because I told you I've been coaching churches in the process of culture change. One of the things I do is I help them with first impressions. So these are pictures taken of actual churches, and I can show them to you now because almost all of these issues have been fixed. But I took them to their board with these pictures. Now, what's wrong with this picture? There's no door. There's no door for the handicap stall. And so how did they solve this problem? They had one guy that had to have the handicap stall with a wheelchair. They made a kid stand in the hallway and not let anybody else in the bathroom while he was going to the bathroom. So we went in with a group of young adults. Remember that, Joanna? That's, you know that church well. We gutted the bathrooms. We did all kind of work to this church. Um, and they now have a closing, workable, handicapped stall, praise the Lord, and a lot of other things that we did for them. But uh, let's, let's look on a little farther. Most of us know that we have a basic minimum we carry in our head. It's an invisible thing, but we have it there. So, for example, when this comes on your TV screen, what happens in your mind? And the announcer says something like, when we come back from the break, we'll be giving the latest health scores and those who failed. Are you interested? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because you're going to avoid those that got bad scores. And those they report had cockroaches running through them. Uh, and so we have basic minimums all the time. We do it automatically. We know, for example, when we drive up to a hotel, whether we're going to stay there or not. You might have seen this wonderful picture on the internet, and you made your, you made your reservation at the Imperial Inn because it sounded really royal. You drive up, what do you say to yourself? I uh, don't think so. Or it might look better on the outside, but you get to into the room. Now, depending on where you come from determines the level of what you'll accommodate and what your needs are. Most of us, when we see this, are going, hmm, not unless I'm really, really, really tired. And then I'm still skeptical about what the sheets are doing or the critters inside. And I have actually had, because we were in West Texas, we had to stay in a hotel like this. It was actually a little bit worse than this. My wife would not get under the covers. We, I had to go out and get a blanket from the car. We slept on top of the bed because we were at 2 o'clock in the morning. We were so exhausted. We couldn't go on, and there was an ice storm happening. We were stuck. She went in to take a shower, and when she turned on the lights, bugs went everywhere. We have basic minerals we carry in our head. You go to a room like that, okay, it might look clean, but still... Most of us prefer more like this. You walk into that and go, ooh, nice. I could stay there. Or, you see, we have this thing, depending on where we come from, that says, this is what I'll accept. And anything below that, not happening. Unfortunately, most of us 
our church building becomes invisible to us. We don't see it. We see a, the big hole and we go, yep, that's our church. We go there. It's great. This is one of our churches. So you walk up the front. First thing you see is a column. Now, the column itself looks okay, but look at the bottom. What's wrong with that? Well, the gutter's hanging off because they had... A, a snowfall they don't normally get, but nobody ever got around to fixing it. So you're going to put your hand on that? No. And even if it's icy, going down those stairs, you'll try to navigate, you know, unless you have to. There's a great retaining wall. What does that say about your church? The pillars of the church are crumbling. Sorry. That's just what I got from it. There's a church flower bed. There's another church flower bed. Now, from a distance, it looks okay, but as you walk along, you find there's actually more weeds and thistles than there were flowers or plants. And the plants they did have were so overgrown, they needed to be shaped. Now, I'll be... Happy to tell you, this was my aunt's church, and she called me after the pastor got a hold of him when I showed this to the church board. And she says, stop talking to the pastor. I said, why? She said, I about died last Sunday at our work bee. <laughs> so what? He said, yeah, the pastor got us out there. We had to do all the flower beds. We had, to, we had people sanding railings and painting railings. And she said, I spent my day in the, in the flower beds, and it about killed me. There were so many weeds in there. I said, well... You guys do it more often, you won't have to get out there that much. <laughs> Fair point. Okay. This at one time was a nice little prayer garden. But what do you see happening to it? You get the, uh, the little thistles that all start growing through. There's supposed to be a little planter for a rose bush in each one of those, which is nice. But look at all between there. So as you walk up, what does that communicate? Maybe they just don't care. Another railing. This is trim uh, up underneath the brick molding up underneath the, uh, the roof line. This is a church down south. And this is where the stucco met the, the other. Whole pieces of trim were totally missing. And again... There's a great looking door. That's actually one of the doors to the church. That's when you open it from the inside, you're coming out. And you start thinking, do I want to put my hand on this? Now, here's the thing. I'll bet you, you could go back to your church, walk around it tomorrow, you'll find at least 10 things that are just like this. That you've grown blind to. You think, well, no, our church doesn't look that way. If I were to actually show you the, the larger picture of the church, they're very nice churches. From a distance, they look really good. I'm showing you details because that's what we typically miss. We get the full picture, but guess who gets the details? Somebody who's first walking into the church. They walk in, they see the, the details, and guess what happens? They begin making decisions about your church before they ever talk to you. And this one church where we went down and helped them do a full makeover, it's a very small church. There's some more up here if you want. Or, yeah, Welcome, glad to have you. Um, so we, um, we went into this church and we did a full makeover on it because they didn't have enough money to do it. But not only that, they were, had totally gone blind to it. And they, they even made the statement board, we're very friendly people. We can't figure out why. Nobody will stay. Well, the first thing when you first open the door, you're looking at is wheelchairs. They had two wheelchairs right inside the front door. The greeter stand should be there, but there's no greeter stand. There's wheelchairs. What does that say about your church right there? It's old. Before you got to the door, there were planters on each side with dead trees in them. The bushes were both dead. They were about this tall. <clears throat> now I've got two. <laughs> I've got two messages. Dead trees, wheelchairs. 
What have I determined about your church before I ever get in? <laughs> if they're not dead, they will be soon. <laughs> so why should I join a dying church? That's before they've ever had the first contact with a person. That's the scary thing. All these details that I just showed you, then they get inside, and we can always say, well, you know what? We didn't have enough money to make, fix the carpet. So it's been that way for 15 years. Um, I will tell you this, the conference does have loans available to churches that you can fix the carpet. And I'm not saying that that's the most important thing. What I'm talking about are the details here. Okay, most important thing, obviously, are the people. But you've got to understand that your church building speaks volumes before you ever get to say a word. When people walk up and they begin to see those kind of details, and then you get into the Sabbath school room and it looks like this. They've grown blind to it. That was their junior Sabbath school room, and they had no place for storage, so... Sometimes they needed extra chairs because they had a bunch of kids that were close by, and sometimes they didn't. So in this particular room, we actually built a wall across there. We mounted a TV on it. We, um, we built benches that were basically little uh, bleachers so they could sit all the extra kids. And they put paddings and that kind of thing. In. But you walk in, and what does that say about your church? Not in, that's not inviting. No! What, what happened to that basic minimum you had in your head? You're comparing it against that basic minimum, and it just fell far below it. So why won't people come back? Because your building says you don't care. Um, this is another Sabbath school room. Now this is Friday afternoon. And I thought, well, somebody will come in and clean it up, but when I came in Sabbath morning, it looked exactly like that. And so we had to help them understand these are the things that keep people from coming back. They've got basic minimums in their heads. They're not, uh, they're not really concerned about the people so far because the people have already told them through their building what they're about. So here's the question you've got to answer. Does your building say, we just don't care? Does your building say, we just don't care? Now, on this sheet here, the YA Liaison Training Session 2, First Impressions Part A, notice at the bottom, there's some things that you can go around your church just to kind of do a quick check on your church. Flower beds, are they weeded and planted with fresh flowers and or plants? Sidewalks, are they level with no major abnormalities such as a mismatched surfaces, chunks, missing, etc.? Exterior doors, is there peeling paint, nasty looking or loose doorknobs or handles? Metal hand railing, has the paint cracked or faded, is rust showing through? Retaining walls, are they in good repair or do they need some patching and repainting? Appearance of the foyer as you enter, is it non cluttered and inviting? Carpet. Your carpet should not be heavily stained or frayed. If soiled, hire a company to clean it as soon as you can. If frayed, make it a priority to replace it. Uh, restrooms, check for cleanliness. And here's a big one that we get all the time, smells. Now you know you got that deacon who goes in there and does his thing. I'm just being real. And, and after he leaves, you can't go in for a while because the whole place. There are little things you can actually plug in to help with that. Uh, Glade makes those, you can get those. But uh, just being aware that that's going to be a possibility. Um, while wooden dividers are okay, but make sure they have all the stall doors that are mounted, they're lockable, because people are very, you, again, you go to that basic minimum. And while wooden dividers are better than nothing, it's best to begin thinking about new dividers. The overall smell in the church. Some people, some churches have gotten so used to the church just smelling the way it does. My aunt's church um, over in Alabama, I used to go visit them, and every time you'd walk into the church, it smelled horrible. And I, I would walk in, every time I go to visit her, and I love my aunt, but to walk in to her church on Sabbath morning and just have that same nauseating smell, I don't know where it came from, but I mentioned it every time I went, and they never did anything about it. Um, it made me not want to go there, and guess what? They didn't have very many young people that ever came there. 
because the smell was so bad. Finally, they decided it was time to build a new church because they couldn't get rid of the smell, whatever. And then suddenly they began picking up new people with, with a new building. Uh, I'm not saying that you have to get a new building. I'm just saying you can install an ozone machine or two, and it'll actually help the, the smell. Glade plug-ins and restroom, they put out a little puff every now and then. Here's the thing with those. Make sure that it's not overpowering, especially for those with allergies. And you want to keep it a light, fresh scent like clean linen. And don't do gardenia in the men's restroom. <laughs> or fuchsia. <laughs> clean linen is really good for men. Uh, but I've been to some churches and the gardenia is so thick, you can, you can cut it with a knife. And you walk in there and you're going, yeah, this smells manly. <laughs> um, but be aware that smells can also put you below a basic minimum. Uh, appropriate decorations that add to the feel, keep them more modern. And let me say just a word about literature because I've noticed this at so many churches that I go around to coach. You need to have a literature rack that's stocked, but not overstocked. Don't try to get everything you've ordered into the rack and have it hanging out and some of them bent back and fallen out. Uh, and don't just leave them there. We stocked it, and now we can leave there until somebody takes it. Guess what? Nobody will take that stuff till the Lord comes because it doesn't look appealing. It's like, well, nobody else has taken that stuff, so it must not be that good. And they leave it there. And it sits there until the dust covers it. And you look at it, and you go, well, that's really old material. I'm not going to read that. It's not fresh. A better way to do things is keep stuff stocked in the back room. I wouldn't even put a literature rack out. I would put it in, keep the literature sorted by topic in your library or a room off the side of the foyer and as you're having a discussion and they you get into a discussion with someone about a certain topic oh you know we got something on that let me get to get that for you i'll be right back you can go in if you got it labeled by topic you can pick that up walk back out see you might like this you'll distribute far more literature that way than just having it stuffed in the rack because people want to get literature from a personal contact. They'll take it and read it there. Very few people walk up and go, wow, that looks really interesting. I think I'll take that. We try for that, but it hasn't worked. And I see church after church after church with literature racks just stuffed, and all they're doing is cluttering the foyer and taking down your basic minimum. That whole idea that you get when you walk in and you say, I'll stay here, I won't stay here. Your building begins to talk. So that's just... Um, just some pointers on that. <clears throat> when you talk about quality, when you're set up to evaluate your space from the perspective of its quality, start by examining the homes, the offices, and the retail or shopping spaces that are right around those homes. Check the people in that area, the people you're trying to reach, and then let that establish the standard of quality. If, um, if they're building real modest homes, uh, the homes they live in, the offices they reach, uh, that they work in, the stores they shop, that'll communicate that level of expectation. So if, they, if they're building modest homes, they'll be satisfied with modest church facilities. But if they're building large, expensive homes, or they work in nicely appointed office buildings, they shop in upscale stores, what happened to your basic minimum? It just went way up. And so... Uh, you will know they'll not feel comfortable in a dated, aging, or unattractive building. Now, some in the church say, well, that shouldn't matter, Pastor. And I've heard that so many times. The truth is, it does. Whether you say it shouldn't, it still does. Because we're not talking necessarily about people who are believers who love the Lord that want to come in. You're trying to also attract people who don't know Jesus. And guess what? They don't have the same affinity for that building that you do. They're trying to decide whether they should even check Jesus out. And so what they go off of is a standard they have, which is reflected in the surroundings they surround themselves with. And we just showed you some examples of motels. And you will go to some of those motels and go, uh -uh, I'm going to stand here. You go to others and go, yeah. They do the same thing with churches. They'll walk in and they'll go, now, or they'll walk in and go, nice. Now, I'm not talking about whether your building is old or not. Because there are people that will pay a fortune to stay in historical hotels that are really old. But they've been well kept. 
and they've been modernized. And sometimes there's even a waiting list to stay in those hotels because somebody back in history stayed there. Um, and it's a big deal to them. Not to me, I'll stay down the road, but my minimums are a little lower <coughs> than my, because my checkbook is also lower. <laughs> but the truth is, it, it does matter. And these are the people we're trying to reach. The hearts are not necessarily right with God. They might be lost, and, and to have an opportunity to minister to them, we have to be understanding enough of their culture to address the basic desires for a nicely built environment. Uh, and part of the problem that we have in North America um, is that we have in the Adventist church retained a mission mindedness, which is good, but we've also retained a sparse mindedness, which is not. In other words, we say, what can we get by on? And as culture moves on, we have failed oftentimes to, to, to stay up with culture that says, oh, the, the new minimums have just moved. When you go into another country to be a missionary, what do you do? What do you do? What, what, what first thing you want to try to do? Adapt. You want to adapt? Why? If you want to share Jesus with that, with that culture, what do you do? Learn the culture. Learn the culture. What else? Language. Language. What else? You work whatever level they're at. Yeah. Unless you're in New Guinea and they don't wear <laughs> basic <laughs> minimums. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just want to make a point about you know you're addressing you know facilities. If, if we if we as you're talking about of course our if we've lost the sense that the purpose of the build the facility is to not only serve the church but also to serve the community and those who may be inclined to come and visit. So for instance, if I were to use the analogy, if uh, if let's say as we came here today, instead of the bagel being on that table, it was on a garbage lid. How many of us would be inclined to maybe go over there and take something to eat? We call it the presentation, right? So if if the church is being served up as like, you know, this is just a garbage lid, you know, a garbage can, rather than this inviting, aesthetically pleasing place, then yeah, I mean if we offend the sensibilities of those who are would be inclined to visit then don't think they're going to they're gonna come. It's the same thing with, with us. I mean, I remember uh, um, when my wife and I were in college, used to like Olive Garden. Mm. I, went to, I went to one that's uh, not too far from, from our house. And I was like, what is that smell? And it's the smell of some kind of cheese. I'm like, I'm not even going back there. I just can't take it. So if you're talking about sense, you know, you know, odors and things like that. Those are, those are all legitimate things to take into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that basic minimum slides depending on where you're at. You know, if you were over in Papua, Indonesia, the basic minimums would be way, way lower. They're thrilled when we go over, we take young adults over and we build jungle chapels for them. And all it is is a, a, a shell, basically, we build metal shells because we have to haul the stuff way up the side of the mountains, our, our young adults do. Um, and we get up there and uh, put this thing together. By the way, there's a trip going in August for young adults that might want to go. We also have a share him trip, this is a little advertisement, to South Africa in July if you want to go on that too. We can talk later. But uh, they are thrilled with a dirt floor, uh, aluminum siding, aluminum roof. It's awesome. Because they just went way up in the neighborhood. But if you were to say in, in, in America, in Calhoun, Atlanta, and say, okay, there's your metal building, have at it. What happened to the basic minimums? It's so far below basic minimums that you're not going to attract anybody. And so we need to do what it takes to do to attract people I'm not saying that we should just, you know, ornately spend money and make palaces to ourselves. What I am saying is we need to make sure that we've met at least societal basic minimums so that it doesn't become a deterrent for somebody to come to Jesus. That's what I'm saying. That makes sense? 
Um, so the quality of your building, and again, it doesn't have to be a new building. It just needs to be well-maintained. Because the old building doesn't necessarily take you out of the running for attracting guests as long as it's well-kept. Um, so those areas to survey that whole list. Uh, maybe as you get back, take a walk around your church with your camera on your phone and just take pictures of those small things. Because the small things all add up. And, you know, if you have one like that, not so big of a deal. This one was on a church that had about 35 things like that around the outside. So I think it was 35, 37 things we had on our list on the outside that didn't even get us to the inside. There's about 45 more. That's why we went and did a complete makeover on the church. But point being, those are some of the issues, whether you like to... To, to believe it or not, that says, we don't care. We don't care. Now, far more important than just the outside of your building are the people you have at the door. Uh, these guys here are real happy guys. You can tell that. Um, happy Sabbath. So, Nate, come and take it from there. Move my stuff out of the way. And we'll have to hook Nate up real quick. I think it was in here. Let me give you the microphone too. USB port. There we go. All right. Well, it was a, uh, I was already trying to do a couple little edits on this and at the same time was getting all the text messages from back at Peachtree City Church because they were very much um, concerned about church service today because we have several hundred, it looks like, at church. I'll show you a picture in a moment from church service there that's going on. Um, but kind of continuing in this discussion, kind of want to go through a little bit of a fun exercise I already told uh, Don I was going to do this so he didn't think I was attacking the conference on this, but always uh, the I always attack the conference. So, um, so how many of you figured out exactly how to get here today by the signage? None of you probably, because... Unless you knew where Georgia Cumberland Conference Office was and knew what to type in on your GPS, there are no signs. None. And then I was one of those ambitious people because I knew I was presenting, so I said, I need to get here a little bit early. There wasn't even a handwritten note outside. I didn't, you know, thankfully, I've been here a few times, so I knew where I was going. When you go back to your church, look to see if you can even figure out, is it obvious where somebody's supposed to go when they show up at your church? I was at a church out in California, and I won't name it. I went to three of the wrong doors at the church. The opposite side. Oh. You're sticking way away. So I went to three different doors that were all locked, and it was a thousand-member church. But those all look like the main doors. And finally, somebody came to a fourth door and pushed it open and goes, oh, this is where we go in at. I'm like, uh, the others all had entrance written on them. And you had them locked. And they're like, well, we're going to fix that. I don't think it was a new issue. So look at those things a little bit. Identify a little bit of what um, 
what you see as you come in. Um, another thing, young adults. We've got amazing young adults in our churches. You don't necessarily have to always stay with the same logo. If the logo is dead that you're using in your signage and your materials, update it. It's not that expensive, not that hard. Everything we have now is very um, nicely logoed. Um, this was something that took place about three, four years ago for our church. Um, actually, each one of those people actually represent a different part of our church. So we actually have a brochure, a flyer that goes out in all of our welcome packets that describes why we have this logo. Um, things like that that really make an impact involve a lot of people. So why do you have that logo? Why do we have that logo? If you notice, there are four people holding hands. They represent four different sections of our church. Is that what they are? Yep, four people all holding hands. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> and if you notice, the central theme is the cross. Yeah, I got that. So everything we do, both all of our outreach ministries, our inreach ministries, our youth ministries, and our church as a whole, our membership, all are united around one central theme, the cross. And so everything we do is about that. Um, you've visited, so you've... The other thing I got when I first saw the logo, I thought it meant everyone is welcome here and we all make up the church. Yep, and that's also designed in the fact that each of our different ministries fit within that logo. Um, so here, this is this morning at church. I, one of the members sent me this because they wanted to know that church was surviving without me. Um, or more complaining that I wasn't there. Um, I'm not sure which. I'll take it that they were convincing me it was going well. You notice the ideal location? We're not that. We're in the gym that gets to be set up and taken down every week. Every week. Because that's PE the rest of the week for the school. Um, so, a lot of our manpower hours of volunteers, stacking chairs, unstacking chairs. Stacking chairs, unstacking chairs. You want to know what nobody wants to do at church? Stack chairs. But we're still there, and it's been 12 years in the gym. So. And in that time, the congregation has doubled in attendance, stacking chairs. And you have plans to... We have plans for a multi-million dollar complex um, on a new piece of property that we've purchased. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a... Yeah. Uh, how, are, how, are you, how are you strategically moving through that, that process? That's what he's going to tell you. I'm going to talk about that, yeah. <laughs> and, and it comes down to it's less the pastor and it's more the lay members. Um, that logo, I'm going to also show you our mission statement, vision statement, and catchphrases. Eighty members of the church were involved in developing it. That's not, you know, so it wasn't the pastor's. The pastors actually literally sat there in meetings and took notes and listened to members talk for hours. And then uh, at the very end, we went to an outside um, entity and said, okay, here's all of our notes. What do we do with them? And that outside entity helped us shape it a little bit, but we spent a lot of hours listening. So who is church for? These are some questions that I want you to take back with you and start asking the question, who is church for? There is another sheet in your thing that has this on it. It has this on it, yeah. So these are questions I want you to start thinking about because as we at Peachtree City started changing who church was for and stopped thinking so much that it was about me and more about the new person that may walk through the door. We have a unique dynamic in Peachtree City. We are not on any major roads. We're not near the interstate. We're 10 miles off the freeway. You have to drive past other Adventist churches from any major freeway to get to our church. We do not get the drive through visitor. The only visitor that comes to Peachtree City has a reason to be in that area. That doesn't involve the church. Either they've moved there, they're visiting family there, they're not your driving through, it's Sabbath, and I needed to find a church. So we have a unique dynamic that way in that we don't get the, uh, the, you know, the drive through. But there's another unique dynamic. It's the sec um, second fastest growing county in the state of Georgia, 28th fastest growing county in the nation. 
Average age of those moving in, under 30. All these young professionals that work in Atlanta, my young adult leaders moved there because the job was there. We stole them from Savannah. Thank you, Savannah, for um, <laughs> surrendering a, a young adult couple. Um, so, um, in fact, today I literally got two text messages about two more young adults that walked through the door at church that some, one of the greeters had, had made contact with and said they've moved to the area, they live here, they're new to church, they haven't been here in the past. We're getting their information, wanted to let you know, make sure that you guys can do the follow-up. You'll hear about that follow-up this afternoon. But our greeters are catching them at the door. <laughs> You're new. Where are you from? What can we do to connect you? Um, so who is church for? Who do we want to have attend? Um, James Emery White made a very powerful comment. He's, he has said, and his church has um, adopted this, who you want to attend is who you need to have up front in church every week. So if you want young people at church, guess who needs to be up front at church? Young people. If you, the person in the audience can relate to who's up front, they're more likely to stay, more likely to come back. And so that would be something to encourage. Um, how do we ease the discomfort of attending church? And all of us here are going, there is no discomfort. A young lady uh, um, named Tracy, she said to use her name not to change it, so I got permission from her. Um, Tracy called the church about a year and a half, two years ago. I'm not an Adventist. I saw something of this guy, Bachelor. I, I've watched a few of his things. I really liked him. Um, can I attend your church? Well, sure. Why? So I called her back. Yes, you're welcome to come. Well, is it safe? Yeah, I think it's safe. Why wouldn't it be? Well, I've never been to church. What, what do you do at church? It wasn't she had never been to an Adventist church. She hadn't been to church. And so all she'd seen was Doug Batchelor and other TV preachers and their churches. Needless to say, she has a little bit of anxiety to crowds. So she was concerned. She goes, well, how many people come? What do I wear? So I went through about a 15-minute conversation on the phone with her. She hangs up, and I immediately text my secretary and the two greeters of the day that would be that next Sabbath and said, keep an eye out for this lady, Tracy. I don't know what she looks like. All I know is she's probably going to be leaving um, um, tracks, <laughs> rubber being left in the parking lot. Not sure she really wants to come in, but she really wants to. Well, she didn't come that week, she didn't come the next week, but proceeds to call the church office, and my secretary gets the phone call this time, and shares with her the exact same thing. So my secretary calls me and says, Tracy called. I said, okay, let's let the greeters know again. I said, hopefully this time, we'll be praying that she shows up this time. That was about a year and a half ago, Tracy's now one of our greeters. She's not a member yet. She's studying. Her son is in our church school. Her husband, who still hasn't quite figured out what an Adventist is, takes as many Saturdays off work at Walmart as he can so he can come as well. Now, we'll talk about how that happened. But it's all about how do we ease that discomfort for that young person, especially, but all age groups. My mom is in her 70s and uh, moved to Georgia after spending the last uh, th almost 40 years in the state of Montana. And so um, moved, to the, moved to Georgia, but North Georgia, close enough to the greater Chattanooga area that you know, she has you know, 100 churches or whatever to choose from. Um, they've, my, both my parents live there and... and they said they visited about 20 churches, and my mom made the comment, I wish I felt that they needed me at church. She's in her 70s. 
I wish they felt that I felt like I was needed at church. She goes, I can go to church or not go, and nothing changes. Nobody even notices. And I went, well, Mom, find a smaller church. She goes, they all seem to be pretty satisfied with what they've got. She goes, I've gone to some of the small ones. And I said, okay, well, I'm a little concerned about that. Let's... So I've been praying and talking with them and stuff. But I have had young adults come in going, well, you guys got it all together. Why would I need to come back? Ease the discomfort. So, let's look at something here. Um, who do you meet when you come into church? Now, I don't know about you, but uh, most people probably initially when they come to church are not coming to meet Jesus. Just, I know that sounds awful, but they probably aren't. Either they've already met Jesus, or they're trying to figure out if it's a safe place. So our goal, obviously, is for them to meet Jesus, but they're not coming to meet Jesus. So they don't know that that's the goal. They are hoping that somebody friendly is there at church that they can get to know. And so I want you to look at this passage for a moment. This is from Paul writing to the church there in Philippi. He says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. And actually that Greek word, is that's a nice way of saying that because that's actually dung in, in the Greek. Um, thankfully the English didn't translate it that way. We probably would skip the verse altogether if it was that way. But he says, I consider everything that I've had garbage, that I may gain Christ. That's a pretty bold statement, everything. He continues, he says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. And as I thought about this passage in this context of when somebody shows up at church, we want them to meet Jesus. They don't know they need to meet Jesus. So there's a disconnect. Unless we are that buffer between meeting Jesus and that person. And so, who do they meet? Peachtree City put a mission statement together. As I mentioned before, 80 people were involved in this. It is a long mission statement, but we'll get to the catchphrase at the end. Our mission statement is to invite our community, not Adventist, notice, our community, which is the two counties, Coweta County and Fayette County, is our priority, our community into a redemptive relationship with Jesus Christ, welcome, welcoming people from all walks of life to experience unconditional acceptance within a loving church family. Um, Continuing on, here's our vision statement. We are a thriving faith community bound together by a desire to be like Christ, genuinely demonstrating God's extravagant love and compassion for humanity. We are known for education, whole person wellness, and serving others. We accept people where they are as children of God and desire for them the vibrant life that Christ provides now and forever. Now, I guarantee you not a single person in our church knows that. But they built that. So this is what they do know, though. Living in Christ, loving through God's grace. It's everywhere. <laughs> if I was to flip back to that picture, you'll notice it's hanging on banners on the side. You can't miss it. It's everywhere. And they know it. And so whether it's the greeter at the door, the elder, they know their job is to love people because of God's grace. And so they, this is our focus. But I realize there's challenges. So here's the challenge. That person that walks through the door, they're going to meet a greeter, and no one wants to be the greeter. We need eight greeters for each two-hour section at our church. So that means we need 16 greeters every Sabbath. Because if you have a door that's unlocked, you need a greeter. And ideally, you need two at every door that's unlocked. We have four of those. We don't get that covered. Because how many people want to miss Sabbath school? Well, there's those who just can't stand Sabbath school, but usually the ones who can't stand Sabbath school probably aren't the ones you want welcoming people at the door <laughs> anyway, right? <laughs> so, so, so we, 
So we have a challenge, right? We have that same challenge. This is not something we have conquered. We've expanded from four greeters to six. We thought we had reached you know, the Holy Land almost on that one. But there's another challenge. Just because they're a greeter and they're friendly, do they have a clue what's going on? Our church has about 200 people in attendance most weeks. We don't have that many that show up for Sabbath school, but a new person walks in and you can tell they're a visitor. Where do you send them? Which classroom? And as I'm walking by and I see that they've just directed a 20-something-year-old to the class that has 70 people in it, I go, 70-year-olds in it, I go, ooh. Well, that was the class they went to, so that was the only one they knew about. Do you know what classes are going on? Make sure greeters. This is something that you don't have to be a leader in the church to make sure and help your greeters know that you have a class. If you have a young adult class going in your church, make sure your elders know. Make sure everyone is familiar with the class. If that means annoying your bulletin secretary for weeks, annoying the announcement person at church for weeks, maybe your email person, whoever sends out your newsletter for weeks on top of weeks, on top, do it. Because it's a challenge. The third question is, how do you feel? What do you see? Who do you meet? How do you feel? We all want to feel good when we leave church. If you've ever been to uh, Disney World, you'll know you don't have just a greeter when you enter. You also have a, a greeter greeting you as you leave. Now, most of our churches probably don't have that. We don't have that at Peachtree City. We've talked about it. But do, does the person, as they leave, feel like they became part of the family at least for that hour they were there or two hours they were there? How do they feel? We'll talk about more about that follow-up um, later on to this afternoon because our church has created a very intentional follow-up, not just with young adults, but with every person that we possibly can connect with when they walk through the door. So the challenge with how people feel is most church members come to church because they need to feel good themselves, right? I came to church to get my blessing. I need filled today. I'm going to sit in my spot that I sat in for 25 years, and the preacher better fill me up because I don't want to have to open my Bible the rest of the week, right? Right? Who cares who that person is up there? That's their own concern. I'm here for me. And the bigger the church is, the easier it is for that to happen. Um, so we try to get a lot of people involved. Um, so recognizing the purpose of church and encouraging change, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You can't change people's attitudes of what church is for from up front. hate to say it, but that never has worked. Church leaderships, expectations. What does the church leadership really want? Hopefully most of you have an involvement in some form of leadership. I know some of the, our pastors are here, some head elders. What is the leadership's expectations of the purpose of church? Is it to feed the saints? I heard one guy say, is it to breastfeed the saints or is it to uh, <laughs> at least get them on solid food? You know, And I went, ooh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I want to say it's that far, but are we getting them ready to bring in the next group? Or are we just trying to stay with the flock we have? And then I invite you, and I know this will be hard, pick a church that isn't yours, not your regular attending one, and go to it on a Sabbath morning. Or you can be really bold and choose a Sunday church nearby and do this, but I It'll be easier if you go to an Adventist church because it'll be more meaningful because it'll be closer to your, your reality. Go visit another church. Don't announce to them, and don't go to one where you have a bunch of friends. Go to one that you really don't know. And go through the process of being the visitor. And then come back and then go, what can I change? What can I make better here? What can I encourage others to make better now that I've been the visitor again. Because when we've been at our church a long time, 
I've been part of Peachtree City off and on for 12, 13 years now. There's things that just come natural. But we've got some really awkward spots in our church because we've got three different buildings and people come from all different buildings to worship and it just, there's always moving parts and it can get very confusing. And so there's parts of that that I've missed out on until I go visit somewhere else that has something similar and I go, oh, that still isn't good. So check out that visitor reality. Here's some discussion questions. I think we have a time for discussion. Ten um, minutes. Ten minutes. You aren't going to get through all these, um, but they will. you might pick one or two that you can talk on. What are some of the things about your physical plant that, tell, that would tell guests that you just don't care? Um, what are some quick fixes that you could have taken care of in the next month? Um, who would you like to meet when you enter a church? What would you describe that greeter to be like? How would you like to feel when you leave a church service? And what can you do to create a healthier environment at your church? Go to work at your tables. <laughs>